Remember last week we talked about the marks of the covenant people, but before you develop a mark, you have to enter the covenant. And so in verse chapter 2, verse 4, it talks about coming to the living stone, which implies obviously movement, but not just attendance. That word coming means to be connected, to remain, to take residence, to, to be in a community and, and a, a fellowship that's not peripheral, but very intense and intimate, coming to this living stone. But then in verse 9, if you remember, there are four distinguishing marks of a covenant believer. The first one is you're a chosen race, you're a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, and it says you are a unique people of God's own possession. And because of this community that we have with the, and the covenant that we have with this, with this Christ, now we're able to proclaim or publish the excellencies and the mercies of one who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But today we're going to take a different turn because that's the marks of a covenant believer. But I want you to get into, as Peter does in verses 11 and 12, into the mind of a covenant believer. These are going to be the truths that God wants us to learn from, from this simple, concise letter in these two verses that really teaches us how to think as a covenant believer. He's going to offer you three truths. The first two are found in verse 11, and the third truth is found in verse 12. But if we're going to be engaged in this spiritual battle, this spiritual mind over earthly matters, if we're going to be engaged in this realm that God has called all of us believers into, we're going to be able to understand how important it is to have the mind of Christ. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks, so is he. So it is so vital that we understand how do we think because the way we think will affect the way we live. So let's look at the three truths that God has called us in this spiritual battle. The first one is found in verse 11. And it's very simple. It says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. So we're going to stop there. The first truth that we need to meditate on today is that the covenant people have transferred their citizenship from the earth to heaven. And why is that so important in the spiritual battle? Because sometimes I think we get so invested, so, so occupied, and I would even say obsessed with the things of this earth that we forget that there's a battle and there's a destination onward. Now, he opens up this term, and it's real interesting because right in the middle of the letter, he throws in this, this um, term, beloved. When's the last time somebody has called you my beloved? Obviously, come on, we have to be more expression how we love each other, right? When's the last time somebody says, my beloved? Well, what that means is obviously your love, but it's, it's more that you're the recipient. When you're beloved, it doesn't mean you're the one that's loved. You're actually the one receiving the love. And so God is reminding the churches in the Roman Empire and us here in Singapore that we are the ones that have been the object of our Father's affection that we are the target of his delight, that, that his love is, 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 is locked in on us. And so we are loved not only by God, but, we, but Peter says, I love you as well. And so he's calling this very intimate in term of endearment and closeness and intimacy with these believers. And now he expresses that to you. So if anybody hasn't called you in a long time, let me address all of you by saying, my beloved. Isn't that, a, isn't that a warm feeling? Isn't that better than my hated one? <laughs> and what a remarkable difference, right? My beloved, you're cherished. You are treasured by our Father. And so today, we've seen the evidence of His love on this table, but now you get to audibly hear you are loved by God. But then he mentions this truth, and he says, My beloved, I encourage you, I, injure, I, I urge you, I admonish you, I, I, I move you, I motivate you. And then he calls us two names. What are they? Aliens and what? How many of you don't feel so loved anymore? Like if somebody comes up to you and say, ah, oh, you, or how about this? Here he goes. Stranger! How many of you feel warm? When somebody comes up to you, hey, stranger, you, 
That, that does not really convey. But this is my favorite. I'm going to use the mezzanine on this one, all right? If all the one in the mezzanine, I'm just addressing you. I'm going to call you aliens. Does that, does that express, like, man, Pastor, I've never felt so loved in my entire life. But that, those words are actually words that seem to be critical words, or, or, or words of criticism, words of condemnation, words of separation. But let's look at these words again, and what is Peter conveying to us as we, he's reminding us we're transferring citizenship from this earth to heaven. So let's look at the first word. First word is aliens. And the word means literally, if you, if you look at the core of the word, it has two words in it, house and alongside. So what they said, if you're not in the house, but you're outside of the house, you are an alien. And it began to grow, that word, where now if you're in the country, or you're, here's a country, but you're alongside or outside of the country, then you are an alien. So we see now what aliens are, that you're not really in, you're outside. You're an exile, you're a stranger, you're a guest. You're, you really are on the peripheral Many times we crave to be on the inside, do we not? We want to be in the power group, the popular group, the, the group that has the inside information. We want to be in the decision-making group. And so we're craving to be on this inside, and yet Jesus, or, or the Word of God clearly defines us as being outsiders, aliens, alongside of the world, not in the world, alongside. The second word is strangers. And this word means temporary resident. It means that you are a short-term visitor. That means there's no legal rights for you. There's no status. And so these two words are very clearly what we would call social words, right? So socially, how do they relate to the people around? Well, you're not in the group. You're outside. You're not in the clique. You're outside. You're not inside the power group. You're outside. You're not in the house. You're outside. You're not in the country. You're outside. Strangers mean that you're just a short-term visitor that you have no legal rights, that you're just passing through. Well, Peter uses these same social words and accurately applies that to our spiritual status. So now, what's our spiritual status? What's the first one? Aliens. That means our spiritual status on this world is this. We're not in the world. We're alongside it. We're not craving to be on the inside power group, on the inside, and where all the decisions are made and the money's made and where all the, 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 the elements of this world is maximized. God says, we as believers are aliens. This is not home. We are exiles. The second word is strangers. We're short-term visitors. We're just passing through. I think, believe, I think some of us have forgotten that. We have put so much energy, so much time, we're obsessed with making sure everything is well here that we have forgot about there. We actually live this life thinking that we are going to have roots here, that we are permanently here. And God says we are not. We're short-term guests. This is not home. We're just passing through. I think sometimes we forget that this world is very temporary. Any of you have lived in Singapore for five years or more? Just raise your hand. Five years or more. Do you know there was a rule? I was kind of surprised when I came. They said HDBs are required to be painted every five years. Anybody know why? Because we're in a tropical climate. And if you look at the HDBs, if they're not painted, you're going, that needs painting. That something's wrong. Our church has been painted a couple of times since I've been here. And it's all because it doesn't last. I live by, used to be railroad tracks. Anybody know where they are? They're all pulled up now. Temporary, right? How many of you seen um, HDBs go down like in one week? I mean, they just, uh, in Gitmo, in, in Holland Village, there were these huge HDBs in apartment, and, and within a couple weeks, they're gone. There's grass there now. Is anything permanent in Singapore? How many of you are on passes? Anybody here on passes? Let me remind you, and this may be a sober reminder, none of those are permanent. You may think you're permanent, but I'm telling you, you may not be as permanent as you think. How many of you have ever seen the road called Beach Road? What used to be on Beach Road? Any guesses? This is a hard one. What used to be on Beach Road? Guess what's not there anymore? Beach. There's nothing permanent in Singapore. It all fades, and not just Singapore, but everywhere. In the West, in the 1895, there's, uh, in the western part of the United States, 
There was a little small town in Colorado that was sagging in economy. And so they had a creative idea, like in November, December, that part of the year when it was really cold. And they brought in a piece of ice. And they wanted to, to build the biggest ice palace in the world at that time. So it was 110 meters wide and 150 meters long. And they chiseled that ice in order to even make 30-meter towers. They put an ice skating rink that was 16,000 square feet. On January 1st, they opened up the new year with this ice carnival. Guess what happened by March? Anybody know? It melts. Does anything ever melt in Singapore? Ladies, does makeup melt? Does hairspray melt? I've seen it. I promise you, I've seen hairspray melt. <laughs> Nothing lasts. But sometimes let's use something a little bit more permanent. There's a mountain range called Mount Rushmore, a mountain called Mount Rushmore. And in the U.S., they have four U.S. presidents chiseled into the side of the mountain, which seems like that's permanent. That's not ice in Singapore, right? But studies have shown, and now the maintenance crew have realized that there are cracks across the faces of those uh, faces that has been chiseled into that rock. And now the water is working its well through, and now there's a maintenance problem because when the water goes in there and freezes, it applies 2,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Nothing is permanent. So believers, if you're going to do spiritual warfare, know this. We are strangers. We are aliens. But our citizenship is not here. Some of you think in heavy investments here. Heavy property, assets, possessions, education, work, relationships, all of these things. We invest, we invest, we invest. And yet everything here is passing. One day I may even do your funeral. Do you know that? And there's not many things you're going to be able to take with you. All your assets are going to be passed to where? Your lovely children. All right? And I'm telling you, nothing is permanent. We are strangers. Our citizenship has been transferred. Second part, we come to verse 11. Now, remember, we're in a spiritual battle. What do you need to think? What mind you must, must you have? Number one, you need to remember that your citizenship is no longer on this earth. It's in heaven. Second one, it says this, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war against your soul. So the second truth that your mind needs to grasp is that the covenant people engage in spiritual battle. This is not a peacetime environment. This is not a holiday. This is not a calm context. God says that we are in a battle. And so I'm going to mention two points. First point, where does the battle take place? Look at the very end. It says, abstain from fleshly lusts that wage war in verse 11 against the soul. So the location of this battle is in your soul. What is the soul? Soul is that spiritual aspect of your, of your creation that God created and put inside of you that is able to connect with God. That part that prays, that part that, that contemplates and reflects and that allows the word of God to become a part of you. This is the deepest and most interior part. It is internal, it is invisible, but it is real. And this is where the battle takes place. There's a war going on. In fact, the word wage war is a word that's used in the military environment that means it's a sustained war. Um, when we were in Israel several years ago, there was a, a guy that says we were here. He was an Arab driver, and he says we were here during the six-day war. That was a short war. This is not a six-day war. This is a long, ongoing battle that will actually take place until the day of your death or until Jesus comes back. This battle is ensuing. It is ongoing. This is going to be a relentless. And this battle is not a simple, oh, I'm getting um, antagonized by the enemy. No, it's a malicious, all-out attack of the evil one to destroy Martin Luther, one of my favorite guys in the, in, in the Middle Ages, especially as a reformer, he address this spiritual battle that's going on inside of us. And this is what he said. As soon as the spirit and faith enter into our hearts, we become so weak that we cannot even think or cannot even beat down the least imagination or sparks of temptation, and we see nothing but sin in ourselves. And I don't know if you've ever felt that, but as a believer, all of a sudden you see your weaknesses. 
All of a sudden, you see the onslaught of sin, and, and you see the evidence of Satan working against you. He goes on. He says this. He says, this battle that's going on, he says, for before we believed, we walked according to our own lust. Now there's a conflict that arises inside of us, and now these are the components that he says goes against us. Number one, the flesh. Number two, the world. The third is Satan, and they all fight against your faith. How many enemies do you have as a believer? Well, flesh. It says abstain from fleshly lust. Satan, he says, I've come to seek, to, to, to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the adversary. He's the liar. He's the father of lies. He's your enemy. Sin is your enemy. It pulls you away from God. The world, the demonic forces. Listen, your battlefield of the soul, there's a battle raging. And now God says, how do you handle this? And so the word of God says this, abstain from fleshly lusts. The word abstain means keep away from. It means put distance between you and that fleshly desire. What's a fleshly lust? The word lust means passion. It means desire. It means that you have a craving. You have an insatiable appetite that is fed by the flesh. And so that flesh wants more and more and more. But yet the word of God says we as believers, we can actually abstain, which means we can win. A lot of times people think spiritual battles, we're already lost, Pastor. This is overwhelming. I'm going, no, 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 no. We can actually win, and we win by the power of God living inside of us and abstaining, putting distance. But the tragedy in the 21st century Christian is this. We really don't know there's a battle going on. Or if it is, it's battle light, or it's not that big of a thing, or it's, it's, hey, pastor, this is just a little tiny issue, or this is a little temptation, or this is a little problem or a little struggle. And Satan actually deceives you and convinces you that spiritual warfare is not that big of a thing. In Latin American country, they were playing football or soccer, and, and during this tournament, the ball went off into a, a pile of, of weeds or high, high grass, but during this competition, nobody wanted to go get the ball and retrieve it because that high grass were known to have snakes. And so all of a sudden, nobody was motivated to go get the ball. But one particular person, he was an equipment manager on one of the teams, and his name was Willie. And Willie said, I'll go, but Willie had a special condition. One leg was wooden, all right? And this is what he says, because they said, why are you volunteering? And he said these words. He says, I've got a 50-50 chance the snake will go for the wrong leg. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is how we treat sin. We got about a 50-50 chance that we'll make it, Pastor. It's not that big of a deal. It's small. It's not that big of a war. It's just a little snippet here. And yet God says, there is a war raging inside of our soul. The flesh is fighting against you. Satan and all of his demonic forces are fighting against you. Sin is fighting against you. The world is fighting against you. You have a battle, and some of you are going, I thought I was on holiday, and you are not. The Word of God says if you're walking with God and you're a believer, there's a war going on, and the reality must be accepted. So what do we do with this war so believers, this is what you do. You think, you must remember. First, we're not home here. We're strangers and we're aliens. Know that. Secondly, we must engage in this spiritual battle. We must abstain from these fleshly lusts. We must draw a line. We must keep distance from the enemy, from the evil one. We must say no to those temptations by the power of God. And yet, it's challenging, is it not? Because these flesh, these things feed us. How many of you have ever heard of the law of diminishing returns? Anybody familiar with that? What law of diminishing? I'm going to apply it to sin. I know it's a, in another area, but it's going to apply to sin today. And so this is the application. That whenever you commit a sin, and by the way, sin is usually pretty enticing, especially the ones that we commit. It feels good. It looks good. And I'm going to even use the word gratify. It gratifies something inside of us. And so what we do is we commit that sin, and we get this really rush, this feeling of gratification, this feeling of, of good or happiness or this, like, this I like. But then what happens is that feeling begins to fade. And so what you're going to do is you're going to want to do that again because that felt so good. But if you do the same thing that you did before, it's the law of diminishing returns. It won't feel the same as it did the first time. So you have one or two options. Either be satisfied with the diminishing returns or in order to get the same 
rush, the same feedback, the same gratification, you're going to actually have to increase the amount of sin or intensify it to get the same feeling. Sin never satisfies. So when you're in the flesh, when you're walking in the flesh and you see suffering, guess what you do? Run. Whenever you're walking in sin and you hear a pastor talking about, this is going to be the year of suffering. How many of you would be excited about that at IBC? You're going, I think I'm going to look for a new, pa- new church. Maybe a new pastor too, but new church. And yet God says, suffering for the sinner and for the ones in the flesh, they crave comfort. They crave pleasure. They crave convenience. But for the Christian, we see suffering in a different light because you know why? We have a different mind. Suffering is now a tool that God uses to shape our obedience. It claims the promise in Hebrews 5.8 that says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Now, instead of running away from suffering, guess what you do now? You embrace it. You go back to the Apostle Paul in Romans 5 when he says, we exult, rejoice, In our tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance brings about character, and character brings about hope, and hope does not disappoint. So instead of avoiding pain and suffering, we allow suffering and pain to shape our character. We had 140 men, I believe, yesterday. If you were there, just raise your hand just quickly. You remember he quoted Romans 8, 28 for those? He stole my thunder, by the way. I had already had it in the message today. But the passage says this. It says that God causes all things to work together for what? Good to those who, two conditions, to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. But then the the speaker yesterday, and Paul says in Romans 8, 29, he continues. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. And so the Word of God says all these things that work together for good, usually it's adversity, pain, suffering, trials, loss, betrayal, all of that. Actually, God uses not just for good, but for the good of us being shaped into the image of His Son. So let me give you a different insight as you do this spiritual battle with your mind, that suffering, adversity, is God's sculpture that shapes your soul. That God uses suffering to actually peel away sin. How many of you have been reading 1 Peter? I've been challenging you. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, it says, those who suffer cease, stop sinning. There's an intimate connection between suffering and not sinning. And God is calling us in this battle that instead of running away from pain, instead of running away from adversity, is move forward and allow the battle to ensue because that battle will actually be used to shape and to sculpture our soul toward the image of Christ. So that's the second truth, that you are engaged in a spiritual battle. Now we come to the third truth. It's found in verse 12. How many of you were excited when it says, oh, there's only two verses. The sermon's going to be short today. (laughs) I just want to disappoint you in that area, okay? So verse 12 is the third truth. And this is, you know, sometimes when you look at the first one, okay, I'm an alien. That's not a, that's not a, con, a, a word of, of, of con, condemnation. That's not a word that is derogatory. It is a compliment, right, church? You're no longer a citizen here. You're a stranger and alien. But then he calls us to say, we're waging war. You need to abstain from fleshly cravings inside of you. And you need to understand there's a battle going on inside of you. But then we, how many of you would say, okay, that's enough. Just, just tell me, you know, I'm going to suffer. I got it, Pastor. I'm going to fight. Okay, I'm going to be faithful. I'm, okay, I got it. But I think most of us are driven by some type of results. How many of you have cooked a meal and nobody's ever said anything about how good it tastes? How long will you keep cooking? And I love, especially uh, uh, some of the ladies that have cooked some Chinese dishes for us, and, and they cook these meals and they say, Pastor, I know it's bad. <laughs> You know, this is my, oh, I so, and and you have to understand the culture, right? They're setting you up. (laughs) Because if you dare have the audacity to say, man, this is horrible. But that's not what they're saying, is it? When they say, oh, this is too salty, or this is too, and really what they're saying is, this is the best dish of my life. This will be served in heaven, and Jesus will eat this. So you got to understand, we need results, do we not? 
We need to see some evidence. And so I'm going to give you some words of encouragement from Peter today that will tell you if you are engaged in this battle and it looks like it's overwhelming, that there is going to actually be an impact, a result. And it will be this. The covenant people will influence those around you. You can actually make an impact. You can make a difference. But it doesn't start so promising. I will prom- I'm going to give you a warning as we read verse 12 together that it starts actually worse than it was when it started. But you have to read the whole verse. So let's pick up in verse 12. This is what Peter tells us. He says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So what they start with as they observe your behavior is, number one, they slander you. The word slander means to speak down. It means to speak evil. It means they're critical of your life. The more you show Jesus Christ, the more you lean on his spirit, the more you're in the word, the more you become a target. Clearly hear that. If you choose to walk with God, you become a target of the enemy. You're going to attract, and not only are you going to attract the enemy, they're going to begin to verbally slam you. They're going to verbally abuse you. Sometimes they come in the form of spouse, children, parents, extended family, co-workers, teachers, students, just random people. How many of you remember the movie Passion of Christ? Anybody remember who, who put that together? Mel Gibson, remember that? This past week, or two weeks ago, story came out that he's trying to work on a sequel. Well, there's another actor named Brad Pitt that looks at Mel Gibson's sequel to The Passion of Christ, and this is what he calls it, propaganda. That's the immediate response when the world looks at you and you're trying to live right. They will cut you, they will slander you, they will speak evil against you, they will verbally tear you down. But the Word of God says this, believer, keep your behavior excellent. That word excellent means beautiful, winsome, noble, gracious, It means when people look at you, be above the fray. God says your behavior, your conduct, everyday conduct, not just in church. Your conduct on a daily basis, on the MRT, on the bus, in your responses to your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to your teachers, to your students, to your coworkers, to your bosses, to your employees, to your friends, to your extended family. Let it be excellent above. Do not let them find any basis to accuse you of evil. In fact, I want to put a matching word that shows up in a different place in Scripture. It's called beyond reproach. How many of you have heard that phrase? It shows up a lot. You know where it shows up? It shows up in qualifications of elders and and pastors. In fact, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, and it goes through the list of qualifications of what a pastor is, number one on the list, ready? Beyond reproach. When you turn to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, you go through the list. First one on the list, beyond reproach. In fact, later on, it uses beyond reproach again. So it must be a high priority. A lot of people mistake beyond reproach equals sinless, perfect. Now, what would happen to you if my qualification here is to be beyond reproach and you have translated that perfect or sinless? You know what? I'm unqualified. The Word of God, beyond reproach, doesn't mean sinless. It means that your life is accountable, that you have to answer for what you do. I do sin. I have pride. I'm independent. I I get angry. I have things that come out of my mouth. And yet, beyond reproach says I repent. Beyond reproach says I fall on my knees and I ask for forgiveness, not only from God, but for the people that I've hurt as well. It means that I have to be answerable not only to you, but to the Word that I'm underneath spiritual authority. And so to be beyond reproach, and let me ask you now, the question comes down to this, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Is your behavior excellent? Is it winsome? Is it gracious? Is it noble? Is it attractive to those who observe you outside of these walls? Does your home and your marriage look like God's grace and God's mercy? Or is it hostile? Is it adversarial? Is it critical? Is the way that you talk to your children, is it winsome? 
or is it the spiritual gift of scolding? Is the way that you respond to people verbally, do they see behavior that is excellent, that is winsome, or do they see somebody that there's no distinction? Do they see you take Scripture, the Word of God, and twist it to fit your lifestyle, to make it fit your agenda instead of falling underneath the authority of God? God says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. One of my favorite writers is Alex McLaren. He's a 19th century Scottish preacher. I can't say it in my correct Scottish accent. But this is what he says. I love it. He says, the world reads us a great deal more than they read the Bible. Hear that again. The world reads us a great deal more than they read the Bible. They see us. They only hear about Jesus. What, what are they reading in your life? Are they looking at you and seeing Jesus? Are they looking at you and seeing somebody that is a contradiction of Jesus? Do they see you and they hear your words and they say, that sounds like the kindness and the compassion of Christ. That sounds like somebody who takes truth seriously. That's somebody who takes a walk with God with, with, with intensity and with intimacy. Or do they see somebody that there's no distinction between the world and your life? God says, keep your behavior excellent because they're going to slander you as the evildoers. Did you hear that? But you know, it doesn't stop there. Praise God, right? Look what it says. Then they observe you. The word observe is not just a casual glance, but it's a locked in gaze. It's not just simply looking at you. It's like locking in on you. And it, they, they actually scrutinize your life. The word observe means that they examine the details over a beer, period of time. And so God's word says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles as you abstain from fleshly lust, remembering that you're not a citizen of this earth, that you now have kingdom citizenship, and now they should see. And what happens when they see you over a period of time, husbands, wives, hear that. Parents, hear that. Children, hear that. Workers, hear that. When they watch you over a period of time, it says now they will glorify not you, but God. In 1942, there was a, obviously an invasion and battle and war going on in the Philippines. And there was a missionary couple that was caught and was put in a prisoner of war camp for three years. Their, their names were Herb and Ruth, and they, even their son was put in the prisoner of war camp uh, by the Japanese and were held there. And, and he recorded in his journal how it was much torture, much death around him. And really it was under the, the leadership of the, of the camp commander by the name of Konishi. And in one particular episode, he says he exposed what he would call a diabolic plan um, to destroy the, not only the, 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 the stamina of the, of the prisoners, but also the, the very heart and hope. And so he actually increased their food. This was his plan. He increased their rations of pala, which is unhusked corn. So he actually gave them a bigger portion of unhusked corn. But yet... If you ever, and I pray that you won't, but if you ever eat unhusked, I mean, not unhusked corn, unhusked rice. If you ever eat unhusked rice, they have that razor sharp edge that if you were to digest it, it would actually cut your intestines to pieces. And Herb says, you would die within hours. Very diabolic plan. But there was a divine visitation, as verse 12 says. When the Allied forces came in and freed the POWs before Konishi could actually execute all the prisoners there and their lives were saved. Several years ago, these missionaries learned that Konishi was actually, he fled the camp, and he was undercover, and, 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 and they couldn't find him, but they finally c captured him, and he was working as a maintenance director of a Manila golf course. Then they sent him to trial for war crimes, and he was obviously going to be executed, but right before his execution, this is what the missionaries discovered, that he actually converted to Christianity. And he says the reason of his conversion is because he saw the testimony of the missionaries that he tortured. So it went from slander, speaking evil, speaking down, to actually glorifying God. God says that if you keep your behavior excellent, that if you hang in there, that you do not give up, that you grow faithful in the things of God, that you remember that you're not in this world permanently, that your home is in heaven and that you fight the spiritual battle, and that you remember you will make an impact. It may not be today. 
It may not be next week. It will be years down, but you will not, you will not be forgotten by God. I had a lady last night said, Pastor, this is the first time I've come. I'm from France, and I am right where you just described. I'm trying to keep my behavior excellent with my husband, but he is not a believer. Would you pray for him? I've been praying for him for 25 years. Some of you may be in similar situations, but a word of encouragement to you, God has not forgotten you. This is a battle. This is not a short little snippet that one week from now, it'll be over. Our, your home may be in a spiritual war zone right now. Your soul is, there's a war raging inside. And I would even tell you that this is out of the six years that our church has, has that I've been here. That this is probably one of the most intense spiritual battle zones that I've experienced and encountered. It's coming in from all sides. And it is so imperative that we as a body of Christ, not only on a personal heart level, not only within our homes, but also within the body of Christ, that we remain faithful. But there's going to have to be a change of the way you think. You cannot keep doing battle the same way you've been doing. You're not going to be able to do it in the flesh. You're not going to be able to do it with your smarts or your expertise or your experience or your knowledge or, or your resources the only way to do this battle is there's going to have to be some changes the way you think. One of the first things, you're going to have to change selfishness for sacrifice. Some of us are so consumed with what's going on with me. If you're in a conversation with a person, and for 20 consecutive sentences, the sentence starts with a letter I, they're selfish. I believe, I think, I perceive, I, I, I want, I need. You can pretty well guarantee that they're pretty self-driven. But if you change that selfishness for sacrifice and God becomes a priority and says, this is what God says. This is what God wants. This is what God is calling me to do. We need to change some things. When we come into worship, we need to change the entertainment for worship. Some people come to worship and they say, Pastor, I came to see a good show. I paid $5 for this. I put it in the offering bag. Where's the good show? This is not entertainment. This is not a show. We are encountering a real and a living and a holy God. And God has called his people to worship him, to get ready for that eternal worship. God is asking us to change our, our intuition in order to, to focus in on the wisdom of God and the word of God. He's called us to change our slick marketing for authenticity. Sometimes when we, when we look at each other, we're thinking, oh, that person has it together. We need a place that we be, can become authentic. We need a place that is real, not something that is perceived, not something that is a facade, not something that is projected, but what is real. And what is real is this. There's a battle going on. There's a war raging, not only in your soul, but perhaps in your home. Not only in your home, but also in the body of Christ. There is a real war going on. You're saying, but pastor, we live in Singapore, the safest place in all the earth. Externally, yes. Internally, Scripture says there's a war. So God is calling us away from what we call cheap grace. Any of you familiar with the writer Dietrich Bonhoeffer? He mentions cheap grace. You know what cheap grace is? God will forgive me, pastor. Oh, don't worry. I'm going to keep on sinning. But you know what? Just keep forgiving. And God will forgive, by the way, but there needs to be repentance. And so Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace, and he says exchange it for what he calls costly obedience. When's the last time you placed yourself underneath the authority of the word instead of trying to make the word fit your lifestyle? God has called us in this spiritual battle. The battle is the word of God. It is not your opinion. It's not your perspective. It's not your comfort. It's not your convenience. It's not whatever you desire to crave and to gratify you where you are. It is to serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We are in a battle. I want you to trade success for faithfulness. I want you to trade power for humility. We need to change the way we think if we're going to engage in this battle. So as we come to a time of close, I'm going to call you to that personal war zone called your soul. I can't see it. It's invisible. It's not on the outside. It's internal. But it's intense. If you come into the house of the Lord at IBC and the word opens up, the battle starts. 
Trust me. How many of you said, I'm so hungry? I mean, you, he gets you so distracted, right? Or, or some of you are sitting beside a person that has a big hair, and you can't see, and you're thinking, I don't think I like her hair. And you think of all kinds of things going on, or, or it's getting hot in here, or, or wonder what, you know, you're, you're thinking about plans, or you're thinking about travel. All of these distractions, because the Word of God opens and the battle starts. And those are just small things. Some of you actually have real battles going on between husbands and wives and parents and children and extended family. Some of you have battles going on in your soul that deals with your work, your relationships, your loneliness, the past life that you've had. And God says, right now, we're in a battle and God has already won. All we have to do is yield to him and give that testimony of our mouth and release that love and that affection for this world and this life and confess our affection and allegiance to him. So as we go into a time of prayer, I want you to simply use the next minute, two minutes, not alone, to yield to him, to recognize that you're in this battle. Just those three truths, that our citizenship has been transferred from earth to heaven, that we're actually engaged in a spiritual battle, and the war zone is our soul. And the battle is raging. But yet, if we stay faithful, God says we can make an impact on, uh, on those around us from slandering us to glorifying him. Just a word of encouragement to you today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for the power of your word. Father, that reminds us in a very sober and a clear way that we are in hostile territory. Father, that this place in the spiritual realm is seeking to destroy and divide Seeking to pull us away from the things of God. Sometimes they come in nice packages. Relationships, family, jobs, schools. Sometimes, Father, they come in just outright sins. Whether they're fleshly lust of the temptations of this world. Of power and possession and status. Father, sometimes they come with distractions like holidays and hobbies. Sometimes they come with physical ailments. Whether it be sicknesses or, or, or pains and, or even loss and death. But Father, I pray that today, as the body of Christ gathers around your word and around your table, that we are going to be reminded to do this battle well. Father, that we will trust you. Father, change our mind. Change the way we think. Father, let our priority be faithfulness and not success. Humility, not power. Worship, not entertainment. Costly obedience, not this cheap grace. Father, change the way we think. In Jesus' name we pray. As we come into this Holy of Holies, just, I'm going to just, for the next minute, I want you just to focus in on what you've heard. If you want to just read through verses 11 and 12 and allow that word to speak to your heart, that God is, is really targeting a specific area, a specific battle that you need to kind of say, God, I need to give you, I need help, or I'm going to give you control over this. Maybe it's a relationship that you need to yield and so we're going to choose this time as a time of prayer for the next minute as we quieten our hearts before the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now.